What is going on, everybody? Kevin Walsh back here on the Sports Kingdom for my first mock draft, full first round post Super Bowl. We got the draft order set: thirty-one Falcons, thirty-two Patriots after their big time comeback. And the only thing I just want to say before I get into these picks is to keep in mind that we're a month away from free agency, which is going to change everything. It's hard to predict what is going to happen, where teams will spend money, who teams will decide to keep. So I'm trying to predict to the best of my ability what I anticipate happening. And also keep in mind that the Combine is going to give us a ton of new information. And as we get closer and closer to the draft, we'll learn more and more which way certain teams are leaning. So here, um, you know, when you're doing mock drafts this early, it's a lot more of a guessing game, but I still feel pretty confident in the picks that I'm going to be breaking out today. So what do you say we get into these picks at one the Cleveland Browns. I think it's got to be Miles Garrett. Uh, and there really shouldn't be much discussion here. He's the best player in the draft. And what we've, I think, come to learn about the National Football League is everyone knows quarterback, most important position. It's it's the game changer. I mean, look at the Patriots. Tom Brady has been great forever. Five Super Bowls with him alone. It, it just shows how important that position can be. I kind of feel, though, as if the edge rusher position is becoming the second most valuable position in this league. We saw J.J. Watt come and dominate right at the gate, his name being thrown around the MVP discussion uh, all of the time. And then we saw Jadavion Clowney step up on his team and just showing how valuable an edge rusher can be. We saw Von Miller win the Super Bowl MVP when the Broncos just won it two Super Bowls ago. Khalil Mack just locked up a Defensive Player of the Year award for his efforts as an edge rusher. Um, it, it just shows that this position is really the one that you use to counteract the dominant quarterbacks that are going to be on the other side of you, and that's what Miles Garrett is going to be. He's been the best player in the country for quite some time now. He has all the intangibles, the speed. He's going to stop the run as well as get to the passer. This is a 100% locked-in pick here for the Cleveland Browns. I can't see this going any other way. I know maybe perhaps some people who don't follow the draft as closely would be surprised for them not to pick a quarterback, but there's two things here. One, Garrett is too good to pass up on, but two, and the more important thing is there isn't a quarterback worth this pick, especially compared to the 2018 draft class. Now, I'm going to break down the 2018 quarterback draft class a lot more in a video coming either Tuesday or Wednesday. Drop a like if you want to see that. Um, but when you look at these re- quarterbacks right now, Deshaun Watson, Mitch Trubisky, Deshaun Kaiser, Patrick Mahomes, there's nobody that you're saying, I have to have this guy. And, and what can make your team uh, really just set back consistently is not getting the quarterback position right That's what the Cleveland Browns have done. There's no reason to repeat that mistake at one, especially with a player like Miles Garrett on the board. Miles Garrett won to the Cleveland Browns. At two, 49ers. Everybody loves quarterback here. I still think that they pass up on a quarterback. I just think that there are some teams that are still going through these full rebuilds that would be wise to wait until next year's quarterback draft class. There are at least four quarterbacks that will be picked in the first round of next year's draft. It is loaded. I promise you it is loaded. Here, I think the 49ers go Mike Williams. Now, that may catch some people off guard, but when you look at his performances in the college football playoffs, he was absolutely amazing, especially against Alabama. That is as close as you're going to get to NFL talent at the collegiate level, is up against those Alabama defenses, and he was unguardable, bailed Deshaun Watson out multiple times. And one of the knocks that has come against Kyle Shanahan, and there's not a ton of them, but is he's not bringing those players to San Francisco, and it makes a good point. The backfield combination of Devonta Freeman and Tevin Coleman has been terrific. They've obviously had some breakout receivers in Taylor Gabriel. Mohamed Sanu, I think, has been, been a little bit better than what people expected. And more importantly, Julio Jones isn't coming. Now, I'm not saying that Mike Williams is going to be as good as Julio Jones. There may be no receiver in the history of this league that at their apex is better than what Julio Jones does. I'm not saying Mike Williams is going to be that, but he is a true, legitimate number one who is going to make life easier on your quarterback and why not have him adjusted to the league for a full season when you bring that quarterback in in 2018 plus now this is something that I think you have to kind of read between the lines here this is a team that was really interested in pursuing Kirk Cousins there's already after last night's Super Bowl talks that the 
Kyle Shanahan is likely to bring Matt Schwab with him to San Francisco. I think that's a clear indication that this team is not in love with any of these quarterback prospects. So offensive guy, you get the next best thing, a number one that your quarterback is going to be able to lean on. That's Mike Williams, receiver out of Clemson. At three... Now we got a quarterback. It's going to be Deshaun Watson for me. Now, a lot of people are struggling here to figure out who is the quarterback. For a while, Deshaun Kaiser actually did look like the guy. However, uh, the Notre Dame real big-time losing streak at the end of their season uh, continued to, to drop his stock a lot. And it's really become Watson or Trubisky, I think, for a lot of people at one. Now, there's people who have Watson uh, as low as three, four into the third rounds. There are people who just hate Deshaun Watson. But I think most people have either Watson or Trubisky at one. Now, I'm not here to tell you which one um, you should have at one. I have my reasoning, though, as to why I think the Bears are going to pick him is because I think they're likely to go for the most NFL-ready prospect, and there's no debating that that is Deshaun Watson. When you look around them, their coaching staff doesn't have the time to wait, like uh, uh, a Buffalo Bills who just brought in all new people or the Cleveland Browns who have fresher guys or even, you know, obviously the San Francisco 49ers, they're bringing in a whole new regime. They need a guy who's going to bring results in now. And they have a receiving core in Alshon Jeffrey and Kevin White, a couple of big time outside wide receivers that can make his life easier. Jordan Howard in year one as a rookie was second in the league in rushing yards. They have terrific interior linemen, so in the second round, perhaps they can work on their tackles or even in free agency. And I think they just have the surrounding pieces to really help Deshaun Watson along the way. They just need to get the guy who's going to help them and make this as smooth of a transition as possible. And I think that that is the Sean Watson. We've seen him excel in the big games, in the national championship games, both of them against Alabama. He was terrific. He has the poise and the experience in what is a big-time game. I know college to NFL is such a massive leap, but there is no bigger stage than a game-winning drive against an Alabama defense on the national championship game. Deshaun Watson thrived in that, and that's why I think the Chicago Bears would be wise to go with Watson at number three. Four, Jacksonville Jaguars. I think it's Jonathan Allen. Now, uh, this is a guy who a lot of people have right behind Miles Garrett for best player in this draft. This is a guy who some people thought could have been a Heisman candidate. He played so well for Alabama out of the, the interior lineman position to get so many pressures, hurries, and sacks and just disrupt the game the way that Jonathan Allen did. He is a truly elite prospect, and I think the Jacksonville Jaguars would be hitting a home run here. You look at last year, they were able to come away with Jalen Ramsey and Miles Jack. There are people who had that as their 1-2 overall prospects coming to last year's draft. They walked away with both of them, and this is a team that's going to continue to build an elite defense while they figure out their quarterback situation. They're bringing in guys that are going to try to figure out Blake Bortles. That's why they upped Marone to head coach from interim. That's, I think, why they brought in Tom Coughlin to really give Blake Bortles another chance this year to see what they got. But in the meantime, build up your defense plus the opportunity to plug Malik Jackson and Jonathan Allen next to one another. Two guys that have the size, speed, and versatility to line up anywhere is going to be a deadly combination. And you're going up uh, against still Andrew Luck and Marcus Mariota, two very good quarterbacks uh, in this division, so you're going to want to get after them, and Jonathan Allen provides you that opportunity. I think the big man out of Bama goes four. Coming out at five, I think it's going to be Jamal Adams to the Titans. Now, this is a little tough here. I think ideally for them, they could have came away with Mike Williams, but I have him going at two. Uh, I do believe he can go that high. But J- Jamal Adams is really, um, you know, it's it's <laughs> you're not complaining if you're walking away with a guy that has this much talent. Uh, I mean, there is really an argument to, to be made for Jamal Adams as, you know, the, the second best player in this draft. I think Miles Garrett's clear one. There's no argument to be made after that, but there's a couple of guys that really can contend for that second position, and Jamal Adams is one of them, the strong safety out of LSU. He can do it all, and it's sometimes a uh, a cliche to say that, but not for this guy. He can cover in multiple formations, and he comes down in the box like a true strong safety should and can stop the run, but he has the coverage skills of a corner, uh, of a free safety. He can line up anywhere, he can play the run, he can play the pass, and the Titans could use some help 
in their secondary. They were not a team that got a lot of turnovers, and Jamal Adams can really free things up, I think, for the rest of their secondary to take some chances, as he's going to be there to clean up any mess that they may leave him. I love Jamal Adams here at 5 for the Tennessee Titans. At 6, another cornerback. I think it's going to be well, another secondary guy. First corner is Marshawn Lattimore. Now, the New York Jets are, to me, the biggest question mark of any team this offseason. They have some older veteran guys that if they want to, they could make some desperation moves and attempt to contend this year. They could attempt at it. I don't know how well it would go, but they could give it a try. Or they can blow this whole thing up. Cut Revis, cut Clady, cut maybe Brandon Marshall. Obviously Fitzpatrick is going, Geno Smith is going. Um, There's just a lot of moving pieces that it could be. Now I'm not sure what the direction is going to necessarily be. You can't say for now, but what I will say is they have to cut Darrell Rivas regardless of their direction. He's making far too much money and producing at not a high enough level for him to be worthy of that contract. Marshall and Lattimore comes in best corner in this draft. He's great in coverage. He's got terrific ball skills, and that's what you want. I think for Darrell Rivas, it was he made people pay so much when they would throw at him. It was not only batting things down, but he would take it away. That's what Richard Sherman would do, is now you're not just scared that it's going to be incomplete, but they're going to go the other way with it. Marshawn Lattimore has those type of ball skills as a corner. He is a terrific player, and I think he makes a ton of sense for the Jets at 6. At 7, Malik Hooker, the free safety out of Ohio State. This is, to me, what could, one of the best fits uh, out of this entire mock draft that I have. Now, there are some people who might say that they have bigger needs outside of free safety, certainly on their offensive line, but there are no offensive linemen worthy of going in the top 10, not really even in the top 15, uh, at least not as of now. But Malik Hooker can come in, and this all of a sudden becomes an elite secondary. And I just think uh, that that you look at what he could do for Casey Hayward, who had a terrific year, and Flowers there as another cornerback. You plug in Malik Hooker, and I promise you, at one point in this man's career, he will lead the league in interceptions. He is that good. It's this is one of the best ball hawks the draft has seen in quite some time. He comes in and will make an immediate impact. I promise promise that of Malik Hooker. Him at seven to the Chargers is a terrific pick. At eight, we get Leonard Fournette. Now, this was actually something I was a little bit hesitant on for a while. Uh, I saw this being mocked, but I didn't think it made a lot of sense. And for the reason that I think the Carolina Panthers are a team that can go from the top 10 to contending for the Super Bowl, similar to how the Dallas Cowboys did this past season. Uh, they still have a lot of pieces in place. And as the year continued, they started to get a little bit more out of their secondary, which was a big time problem early on for them. What is the biggest glaring weakness? on this team is the offensive line but as I just mentioned there just aren't really many that are worthy as of now of being top 10 selections so what I think could be the next best thing for them is to protect Cam Newton because that's why you need the offensive lineman is bringing in a running back like Leonard Fournette now I know Jonathan Stewart's there yeah and he had a good season but he hasn't played a full 16 games since 2011 he is consistently hurt and he's going to be 30 by the time we start next season. You bring in a guy like Leonard Fournette who's going to be able to carry the workload. He's so explosive while being so big. The stuff about him being the best running back prospect uh, since Adrian Peterson, no one's shying away from that while they watched the, the rookie year that Todd Gurley had, while they watched the rookie year that Ezekiel Elliott just had. No one shies away from it. He is that type of prospect. Had he been in the draft last year, he's the one that goes for, not Ezekiel Elliott. He is that good good of a player. He comes in and that backfield of Cam Newton and Leonard Fournette is going to cause NFC South defensive coordinators nightmares for years and years to come. I think that Leonard Fournette to the Carolina Panthers is a really, really strong pick here for them. At 9, I think it's going to be Reuben Foster for the Cincinnati Bengals. They they need a Mike linebacker. They need an inside guy who is going to make them faster, younger, and he's a smart player, a heat-seeking missile that finds the hole quicker than anybody. He's a guy who has the potential to lead the NFL in tackles one year. And the, really, the only concern, I think, that comes uh, out of Reuben Foster, I mean, there are people who say, you're going to plug this guy in, and he's going to be your cornerstone of your defense for the next decade. 
decade. And, and I don't I don't disagree with that. But the one thing that people do somewhat worry about is did the Alabama defensive line make things too easy for him? And perhaps in a situation where they don't come that easy, is it going to be a little bit harder? It was such a talented team that some people are hesitating on how will some of the surrounding players thrive outside of that. But I just don't have that question mark with Reuben Foster. He's shown to be terrific. He can come in and truthfully, as a rookie, be a leader for the Cincinnati Bengals. I love him at 9 to Cincinnati. At 10, another quarterback. I think it's Mitch Trubisky that goes here to the Buffalo Bills. Now, I said it's tough to predict what's going to happen in free agency. And if Tyrod Taylor comes back, then this is dead wrong. And we'll know that uh, when it comes around March, if Tyrod's going to be there. But I just have this feeling that he's not going to be. I, I don't think that he's really going to be willing to take a pay cut for this team. And they're not going to keep him next year on the deal that they would need to. Uh, I just think that that could push Tyrod out of town. And I don't think they're going to come into next year with Cardell Jones as their starter. And the thing that the Buffalo Bills have that I don't necessarily think that the Chicago Bears have is the time to groom Trubisky. People worry because he only had the one year at UNC. And that's why some wondered, perhaps, could he go back and show us more? Would that lock up his spot? I mean, this is a guy that could still go uh, highest two to the San Francisco 49ers here. So I think that him coming out made a lot of sense. He's got good mobility. He has a strong arm. And he only threw three interceptions Uh, in the regular season. It was... um, as a, the UNC Tar Heels starting quarterback, uh, the, I think a lot of the questions really come to be with the unknown for this guy. But as they bring in an entire new staff, a new offensive coordinator, Sean McDermott, now leading things as the head coach. I know he's a defensive guy, but they're going to still need a quarterback. And if Tyrod walks out, they don't come into the year with Cardell Jones as their starting guy. I don't think so, at least. And I think that makes Mitch Trubisky their guy at 10. So that rounds out the top 10. That gives us the Saints at 11. And here, I'm going to go with Derek Barnett. Now, this is a guy I think uh, some people are starting to really undervalue. Uh, we're, we're just seeing names kind of jump him, jump him, and, and jump him. And, and I'm not sure why. He has been as productive as any edge rusher in the SEC, not named Miles Garrett. I mean, he's been probably the second best defensive player in the SEC for the past three years outside of Miles Garrett as far as a consistent production wise. He had 13 sacks last season. That was good for sixth most in the entire country. And that's more than anybody else you're going to see taken in this first round. Again, including Miles Garrett. He was amazing for Tennessee. And I think the prospect here of this of the New Orleans Saints getting him makes their defensive line actually really scary. When you think about Cameron Jordan, He's amazing. Nick Fairley is pretty good. Sheldon Rankins is a guy that they took last year, and he is going to continue to develop. Obviously, they really liked him as an interior defensive lineman. You put Derek Barnett on the other side, and that becomes a fierce front four that you need in the NFC South. Look at the quarterbacks that they're playing. Cam Newton, Jameis Winston, and Matt Ryan. You have to get to the quarterback here. I think Derek Barnett is a slam dunk pick for the New Orleans Saints here at 11. At 12, okay, now this might be the one, uh, I think more than any, that leaves people scratching their heads a little bit, and I I fully admit that. Um, But I got Jabril, Jabril Peppers going at 12. This was a guy that during the season was a lock top five pick. Nobody even scratched a nose at it. It was obvious for everybody. As the season progressed, people started to pick, pick, and pick more at the holes in his game, specifically at his coverage. But I think that Jabril Peppers is fully aware of that. When he declared for the draft, he didn't just declare. He he commented on his poor coverage skills and how he needs to get better on them and how he will spend tireless hours working on that part of his game to be better. And I'm not going to doubt a guy who has his speed, athleticism, and intangibles to not figure that out. I think he does have that skill set to figure it out. And the Cleveland Browns are a team that have the time to figure out 
where he is best suited. Some people say, is he really a slot corner? Is he a strong safety? Is he, uh, you know, a converted linebacker? Is he similar maybe to the Deion Buchanan role that the Arizona Cardinals used for him? Where is the best place to put Jabril Peppers? Uh, a lot of people would say the answer is just put him on the field and let him make a play. I think that as simple of an answer as that is, yes, he's going to improve his coverage skills while getting coached up through this offseason, through the next offseason. Perhaps this isn't going to be the prettiest of picks year one. But as time progresses, I think Jabril Peppers can still be a terrific player. And I think that you can't really overstate the importance of pleasing the fans sometimes. To pass on a quarterback here, you have to give them something uh, that they're going to be excited about. And this is something that's going to get them excited. In the first round, you walk away with Miles Garrett, the best player in the draft, and Jabril Peppers, the lone defensive player who made it to the Heisman voting, a player that they're familiar with, and a player that you're committed to getting the best out of. I just think that this could be a really, really good draft for the Browns. And this might be where we look back as the start of the Cleveland Browns regime finally figuring things out. Out. I got Jabril Peppers at 12. That's when I really want you guys to comment down below uh, on your thoughts on Jabril Peppers. Where do you see him going? Because, uh, I mean, th- there are people who still like him as a top 10. There are people who got him out of the first round. I, I really want to hear your guys' thoughts on Jabril Peppers and where you think he should go. And that is going to move us on to 13 for the Arizona Cardinals. And uh, to me, there's two positions of need here that stand out uh, big time. We've got corner and we've got receiver. Now, as far as receivers go... Fitz coming back. There's a couple of names in free agency uh, that they can go. They still have John Brown. I think that I'd put that on the back burner. They'd still address it in the draft at some point, but see if you can maybe hit a late home run uh, with that pick and go corner here. Because you have the opportunity to take the second best corner on the board, because only Lattimore is gone, I just think that that's can't miss. You look at Sidney Jones, that's the guy who I have coming out of Washington. He has everything that, that you want in the build. He was rarely tested in college. He was not to, uh, often targeted, and I just think that he's now going to come in and be targeted a ton uh, with Pat Pete on the other side of him. That's fine, though, because I think he has the size and the technique to be a top-level corner in this league. And then once again, you look at that secondary. It's Pat Pete, it's Tyram Mateo, it's Dion Buchanan, and then you plug Sidney Jones in on the other side, and this secondary becomes once again the, the one of the more daunting groups in the entire NFL. They were still strong last year, but there were games where they really, really just threw up some stinkers, and I think that Sidney Jones can be the perfect complement to get the Arizona Cardinals back to that elite level, because this is a team again that has a ton of talent and they aren't far away where if they can figure it out they can still contend at an elite level next season now 14 15 is weird for those of you who don't know the Colts and the Eagles are going to have to do a coin toss it's actually going to be the Vikings and the Colts and then the Eagles are going to take the Vikings pitch uh, pick for the coin toss um, to see who goes 14 who goes 15 for now it This wouldn't change my draft where I have them. I'd have each team taking the same, but I'm going to start with the Eagles at 14. And who I have them taking is Dalvin Cook. Now, this is a little tough here because Corey Davis is still on the board. However, the Eagles, I think, seem to be uh, set on trying to address wide receiver within free agency. I don't think they're going to be patient in their pursuit of getting Carson Wentz more and more weapons. They were linked to Alshon Jeffrey around the trade deadline time. They have already had their name linked to Deshaun Jackson and Kenny Stills in free agency. So I think it's likely they have that sorted prior to coming into the draft. And even if they don't, I still think they probably go for Dalvin Cook. He's a perfect fit for the Peterson offense. It's similar to what Andy Reid runs, and Dalvin Cook gets the comparisons to Jamal Charles. He's amazing out of the backfield. He has mind-blowing speed. Uh, He's just a terrific three-down back that is going to be next to Carson Wentz for years and years to come. And honestly, if you want to fantasize over a a little bit here, the Dak Prescott-Ezekiel Elliott backfield against the Carson Wentz-Dalvin Cook backfield, I think it could be a matchup that goes on for well over a decade between those two groups. I think Dalvin Cook with this system and it would be perfect. He'd take a lot of pressure off Carson Wentz and I love this pick here for the Eagles. At 15, I got the Colts going for Solomon Thomas. Now, 
Thomas is a guy that has skyrocketed up draft boards as a redshirt sophomore, and then that doubled with his performance against USC, uh, UNC in the bowl game. Seven tackles, five hurries, uh, a sack. He was in the backfield pretty much whenever he wanted, specifically on the last drive. He just decided that UNC wasn't going to win the game, uh, really almost at will. Um, this is a guy, uh, truthfully, 15 may be way too low for him. He's continuing to move up in draft boards. I have him here, and it's really just a test to how deep of a draft I really believe this is, him falling to 15. For the Colts, what makes most sense for them? They need edge rushers. What they got out of Walden was nothing, and Trent Cole is extremely old. They're going to need to continue to get after the quarterback. Again, we mentioned the importance of being able to pressure quarterbacks. They get that in Solomon Thomas. At 16, the Ravens come away with Corey Davis. This is my number one candidate right now. This is a video I plan on doing a little bit later down the line. Again, this will all depend on free agency and stuff like that of big time uh, teams that are uh, really got a lot of potential to trade up or trade back. I think the Ravens are a team that's going to want to trade up because for them, I think there's really only four guys that they would really, really covet here in round one. It'd be Corey Davis, it'd be Mike Williams. Dalvin Cook, Leonard Fournette, one of the top two receivers or one of the top two running backs, I think, is what they want to come away with here. And in this scenario, they get Corey Davis, Steve Smith retiring. Mike Wallace is good, but Kamar Aiken is now a free agent. And then you have Brashad Perryman. I just don't see how he can figure that out. Corey Davis is a guy who is a legitimate number one in the country. He was eighth in catches, seventh in yards, and first in touchdowns. He comes in, and he's going to be the number one for years as the the Baltimore Ravens continue to grow. And I think that's a right-away type of thing. And it works a, a lot because now you're going to take a lot of attention off Mike Wallace, which is crazy to say, and that'll free him up a little bit more for those big-time explosive plays that he's so known for. Love Corey Davis at 16 to the Ravens. 17 for the Redskins. I got Malik McDowell, the DT, coming out of... Michigan State. Now, there are some people who question this guy's motor, and that's the big question around him. When he is going out there and he's given the 100%, he is sometimes unblockable out of that DT position. The Redskins, they this team needs a hand on the ground, a bull who is going to go forward and create pressure. They they don't have it, especially out of the defensive tackle spot. Malik McDowell, to me, still the best pure defensive tackle in the draft, there's going to be a lot of questions about that motor, that energy, that consistent effort level. And I think he's, I'm sure, he's heard this. And I think as you get closer and closer to the combine, pro day, interviews, you have the opportunity to write that and explain things and prove that that will no longer be the case for you. I think the need is far too big for the Redskins to pass up on a guy like Malik McDowell with his potential and upside. At 18, Tennessee Titans, their second pick in the draft, this time their own pick. Jalen Tabor, corner, is also known as Tej Tabor, out of Florida. Now, for me, this right now, it just wraps up the secondary for this team. You walk away with Adams and Tabor. Uh, This is a team that finished bottom 10 in takeaways. Tabor, over his past two years, intercepted or got a hand on 25, over 25% of the times that he was targeted. Got a hand on it over 25% of the times, one in four. This is a playmaker elite ball skills and will turn the rock over with him on one side, McCourty on the other, Jamal Adams wreaking havoc as the strong safety. All of a sudden, what was a weakness of the Tennessee Titans becomes an extreme strength. This is a team that seemingly fixed their offense in one year by adding a tackle, DeMarco Murray, Derrick Henry, all of a sudden their offense can't be stopped. Here, they have the opportunity, Jamal Adams, Tez Tabor, Two picks in the first round that go to the secondary to just completely turn that around. I think that this would be a perfect pick for the Titans. At 19, you want to talk about perfect picks. I think O.J. Howard would be amazing for this team. Howard is the best Titan prospect since Gronk, and honestly, he's probably a better prospect. Not a better player, because Gronk has gone on to become what is probably the greatest Titan of all time. But as far as prospect when they were coming out better than Gronkowski. He is an amazing run blocker, and he is so athletic in the passing game. There are so many different ways that he can hurt you, and I think that is why you want to have O.J. Howard, because this team now has a question 
at running back here. They're going to probably address that round two, round three, because mm-hmm. Doug Martin is now in rehab. Uh, it's A lot of questions are going to be there. Well, your new running back is now going to have an elite tight end blocking for him, and that is so important. But also, Jameis Winston loved the tight end position. He made Cameron Brait look so good. Now, he is a restricted free agent. They could choose to bring him back. They could choose not to bring him back. But even if they do... Two tight end sets, he can use that terrifically. Stalker was their other tight end. He was atrocious. You have the combination of O.J. Howard and Cameron Brait going over the middle, bringing in so much attention. All of a sudden, it's freeing up things for Mike Evans, and it's allowing Jameis Winston to continue his develop, development. And in year three with O.J. Howard, it could be the full breakout year for Jameis Winston. At 20, we got the Denver Broncos here. I'm going with Ryan Ramzik, the O-tackle, offensive lineman coming out of Wisconsin. Now, they they are set on giving Trevor Simeon the job for whatever reason, and and if that's what you're going to do, then you better do everything in your power to make sure that he, amongst everything else, is in the best position to succeed. There is nowhere else that you need to look considering the way this offensive line has looked. Now, the thing is, there are some people who wonder if Ramsick is going to be able to cut it as a left tackle prospect. They wonder uh, about his length, really, uh, specifically out of that position. Perhaps he's better as a guard or a right tackle. Well, that's fine, because the right tackle position was cringeworthy coming out of the Denver Broncos, while Okung on the left actually did a fair job. So you can take Ramsick put him over on the right side, continue to coach him up, and then perhaps he can then really calmly work into the left side when Okung is eventually gone from Denver. First offensive tackle off the board, Ryan Ramsick out of Wisconsin. Going for the Lions corner, Quincy Wilson coming out of Florida. Uh, outside of Slay, the cupboard's dry for this team. Uh, they gave the second most touchdowns, passing touchdowns in the league of anyone. The only one they gave up more was the Cleveland Browns. I think that puts it into perspective. This guy is a press corner. He, and that I think is important because when you're giving up a lot of touchdowns, Um, It means teams have a lot of time to kind of dissect you. So press coverage, obviously you're not going to get off the line quickly. And also it allows your edge rushers to get up the field more, and that's going to be better for Ziggy Ansah. And I just think that Quincy Wilson would be a perfect fit for this team and a compliment to Darius Slay, who would be on the other side. For the Dolphins, to Karis McKinley, edge rusher coming out of UCLA. Now, with Tack McKinley, uh, the thing about him is he had arguably the highest peak of any edge rusher in this draft. Uh, His peak might have been the highest. The three-sack performance against Utah was unbelievable. Unbelievable for him. And and there were just a lot of games where he showed the flashes that he can be an elite edge rusher. And if you look at the D-line for this team, now Cameron Wake played terrific this year, but he's 35 years old. Mario Williams, the third tier you old, he's a free agent, so he's likely gone. You're going to need someone on the other side. And also, the, the opportunity for him to learn from Cameron Wake. I don't think this is probably the only pick that they put towards the D-line, but I think it's the first one at 22. The Dolphins take Tara Karras McKinley. Now the Giants pick here, okay, 23. I have them going with Zach Cunningham, the linebacker out of Vanderbilt. And for those who know the Giants draft history, they never take a linebacker. Ever. Hear me out, though. This team's defense was historically bad almost coming into this year, what, coming into last offseason. And what they did was they spent, and they spent, and they spent, and they fixed it. Landon Collins progressed. Olivia Vernon worked out. Bringing in JPP worked out. Janoris Jenkins has become a top 10 corner undeniably, and everything worked. Now, they ignored that linebacker position. However, what is now the big concern for this team appears to be their offense. Odell Beckham is the only option. There's no run game. The offensive line can't block. So I kind of anticipate now the Giants simply going, okay, we're going to fix the, we're going to fix the offense now with our money. And I think that they'll bring in perhaps a new running back. I think they're certainly going to address some of the offensive line issues, and they'll likely bring in another weapon, uh, whether it be a tight end or another receiver for them to work with. What that would leave them with is still the gaping hole that linebacker is. And Zach Cunningham is amazing. Now, I have him here at 23 because, again, you have to go off what is the general consensus here. I think it's foolish sometimes when people do these mock drafts and they just put uh, their own personal egos in front of everything. But I think that there's a legitimate shot that Zach Cunningham is the best linebacker in this draft, Reuben Foster included. He led the SEC in tackles. Reuben Foster plays in the SEC. 
He's that good, and he doesn't have the defensive line of a Reuben Foster opening up the holes for him. And I think he's the best coverage linebacker in this draft. You combine those two things, and I think Zach Cunningham's a can't miss prospect. And I think he'd be an. I think that's a, a grade A, A plus, A plus 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 for the Giants if they were able to take him there. I know they never tank linebackers, but. You got a home run staring you in the face. I just don't see how they pass up on it. Another linebacker, I think, goes at 24 for the Oakland Raiders, Gerard Davis. Uh, When you look at this team, their second day was really bad to start the year. However, I don't think they're going to cut bait with Sean Smith. They gave him a good amount of money. There's not a lot of options, really, in free agency to fix things. And, um, you know, I don't know how much people maybe will subscribe to this, but Pro Football Focus graded him as an above-average corner on the year. So I think that that could perhaps lead to the idea that Sean Smith progressed as the year went on. And surely if Pro Football Focus sees it, then the Oakland Raiders may see that type of progression too, and they might not just get rid of him after the one season. Where they have undeniably a gaping hole is inside linebacker and that's where Gerard Davis comes in he's a really good tackler but what he excels at is in coverage and again they were often picked apart in their secondary but also in the middle levels and that's where Gerard Davis can come in the linebacker out of Florida and have a big time impact for the Oakland Raiders at 25 My favorite pick uh, of this entire mock draft, it's the Sean Kaiser to the Texans. Now, some people may say, come on, how are they going to spend a first-round pick when they paid all that money to Brock Osweiler? My point is exactly. Uh, I think what you have here in Brock is it's hard to justify benching him when he's making so much money. You can't cut him. It it, It would cost you a ton, and it's damn near impossible to pay anybody else because of what you're paying him. However, A first-round draft pick spent on a quarterback can fix everything. The contract isn't as big as someone that you would have to bring in. And the way you justify benching a guy making that much money is saying, well, we're surely going to start our first-round draft pick, Deshaun Kaiser. And that's what I think the Texans do. This is a guy who, to me... I still think has the highest upside of any of the quarterbacks in this draft. And I think still that Bill O'Brien is a terrific head coach. There are sometimes he makes some bad decisions, but you know what? He's not been handed the best hand to really work with here. He was not the one that pulled the trigger on Brock Osweiler, and he's been given bad quarterback after bad quarterback after bad quarterback and continuously now made the playoffs in back-to-back seasons. He's made the, He's won his division with Brock Osweiler and Brandon Whedon and Ryan Mallett and Brian Hoyer and TJ Yates. I mean, this guy gets the job done. You give him a guy like Deshaun Kaiser who he wants and can actually mold to what he wants him to be and put him in his offense, the weapons are still all there. Plus, they get J.J. Watt back. This is a team, I said it last year and I still believe this, they figured out quarterback They're a Super Bowl contender. I think they take Kaiser at 25. At 26, I think we have the Seahawks going with Forrest Lamp out of Western Kentucky. If you haven't heard about this guy, you really should go do your research on him. He is a terrific prospect. Now, the thing is, is it going to be tackle or is it going to be guard? That's why I have him coming here. As opposed to Cam Robinson, I think that the versatility provided by Forrest Lamp is why the Seahawks would be wise to draft him. They've got problems everywhere on their offensive line. Guard or tackle, you bring Forrest Lamp in and you find out what he really is best suited for. He had the best performance of any tackle up against Alabama's front. There was no tackle who had a better performance than Forrest Lamp, okay? The fact that he can become a guard, though, for you with his speed, size, and good hand usage is really why I think Forrest Lamp is such an exciting pick here and to me makes a ton of sense for the Seattle Seahawks. At 27, John Wa- John Ross, the receiver out of Washington, is the man that I'm going to go with. Uh, this is a team... That's receiver play was abysmal last year. Now, I still think Jeremy Macklin can be your one. I think that Tyreek Hill is going to get more reps, and that's exciting. And Travis Kelsey is minus Gronk, arguably the best tight end in football. But you add John Ross, a guy with that type of speed, and perhaps it forces Andy Reid and Alex Smith to open things up a little bit more. But also, what I think is nice about this and what Tyreek Hill showed is when you have speed like Hill does and the way Ross does – these five-yard slants, 
five yard outs, five yard ins that are constantly ran by the Chiefs, well, you can change that into a 70 yard home run play. John Ross has that type of speed, and I think that he's the pick for the Kansas City Chiefs. Almost done here. 28 Dallas Cowboys, Tim Williams, the edge rusher, Alabama. You see how far down he is. I just think, again, it has to do with the depth of of this draft. That's why Tim Williams has fallen so far, but he's still a really, really good player. A, a Made a lot of problems for a lot of teams as the edge rusher coming out of Bama. He gets up the field so quickly and forces the quarterback to come back inside and it'll close that pocket down. And the Cowboys, they need edge rushers. They need him desperately. I still think that they would have picked Joey Bosa had he been on the board over Ezekiel Elliott last season. Their corners are both of them free agents, but apparently reports are they're likely to bring back at least one of them. So if they're going to do that with a little bit deeper of a cornerback class, I think they address the edge rusher need in the first round here, Tim Williams to Dallas. At 29, a team that might have to go cornerback a couple of times is the Green Bay Packers. I think the first one they take is Gary and Conley, corner out of Ohio State. Now, he had a really good season, and the only question mark I think that lingers over his head is when you have guys like Marshawn Lattimore and Malik Hooker playing in the secondary with you, it can taint you. And and you know what? It's nobody's fault, but that's what happens. People start to wonder, how would you be without those guys? I still think that he is worth uh, that shot by the Green Bay Packers. The, The film shows that he is a terrific player still and has the potential, and Green Bay, they just need corners. You saw them get torn apart by the Giants in spots, Dallas when they figured it out, and even the Atlanta Falcons at will. Uh, when this team can figure out their corner, then they have much better chance of finally contending. At 30, Taco Charlton coming out of Michigan. Uh, This is a really, really good player, and he closed the season so strong for Michigan, and I think that they could use the edge rusher. James Harrison's continuing to get older, and Jarvis Jones has certainly been a bust, and I doubt it. He is with the Steelers next year, so I think you bring in Taco Charlton, and he comes in, the Michigan edge rusher, and makes an impact. Another edge rusher at 31 is going to be Charles Harrison. Harris Harris out of Missouri for the Atlanta Falcons. Now, we saw what them getting Vic Beasley uh, to do, how important that was for them. 15 and a half sacks, and he was almost in a way sometimes the saving grace of this defense. They were so young in so many spots, and he himself, Beasley, was young as well. But it shows that Dan Quinn's still a very good defensive coach. When he gets his hands on a player, he has the opportunity to mold them and turn them into a terrific player. You get Vic Beasley on one side, Charles Harris on the another, and that is very scary. And again, we mentioned earlier in this video, I mentioned in this earlier in this video, NFC South. You're not playing against Matt Ryan. Yes, sub that in for Drew Brees. It's Drew Brees, it's Cam Newton, and it's Jameis Winston. You need edge rushers. You get one here in Charles Harris. And finishing out the first round, finishing out the mock draft, is David Njoku, the tight end out of Miami. Had seven touchdowns in his last six games for the U. He really came on strong. He's very athletic. He can burst up the seam. And I think the Patriots are going to actually need a tight end. I think Mark Tallis Bennett probably finds a new home. And the injury concerns of Gronk, you bring in David Njoku. This type of athleticism, the Patriots will make work wonders. That is going to do it. Only 42 minutes. Thank you so much if you have lasted the whole time. I really appreciate all of the support. I ask for a couple of things. Drop the like button. Hit the subscribe button. But more importantly, can you just comment down below, do you prefer me to do full-length videos like this that's going to go about 42 to 45 minutes in length, or would you prefer it broken up perhaps into fives or into tens? That information is just to make the content more easy uh, to watch for you guys, and I always appreciate you checking out. Hit the like button and comment down below your thoughts on the drafts. Did I get your team right? Did I get your team wrong? Did someone fall too far? Is someone up way too high? You let me know down in the comments, and I will comment along with you guys as I love to talk this stuff. The next time we do one of these mock drafts, probably going to be after the free agency period, maybe after the first week or so, but I will be doing a video pretty soon on the 2018 QB draft class, so look out for that. Kevin Walsh, Sports Kingdom. I'll see you guys next time.